Malachi, chapter 4, verses 1 to 6, which can be found on page 962 of the Church Bibles. Malachi is the last prophet of the Old Testament, where God promises he'll send a prophet like Elijah who will call the people to repent. Malachi chapter 4. Surely a day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubborn. And when that day is coming, we'll set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or branch will be left of them. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. And you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Then you'll trample on the wicked. They'll be like ashes under the soles of your feet on that day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. Remember the law of my, my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at horror for all Israel. See, I'll send up the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents, or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. The New Testament reading is from Mark, chapter 6, verses 1 to 29. That's on page 1008 of the Church Bibles. Mark, chapter 6. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did these man, this man get these things? they asked. What's this wisdom that's been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offence at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honour, except in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there, except lay his hands on a few people who were ill and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around, teaching from village to village, Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Where, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if in any place will not welcome you or listen, to you, leave that place, shake the dust of your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed with oil many people who were ill and healed them. King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead, and that's why miraculous powers were working him. Others said, he's Elijah, and still others claimed, he's a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. But she was not able to because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, ask me for anything you want.
want and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once the girl hurried in to the king with the request, I want you to give me, right now, the head of John the Baptist on a dish. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John the Baptist in prison, and brought back his head on a dish. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing this, John's disciples came and took his body and laid it in the tomb. Thanks for reading that, Rebecca. And uh, do keep that passage open. Let me have my welcome to Tom's. Great to see you here. If I haven't met you, my name's Pete, and I'm one of the ministers here. And as uh, Tom said, we're continuing in this series that we've called Good News. But today, as we go through this passage, we see a response to this good news, which is rather shocking. We see rejection. And one of the questions we're left asking is, why this rejection? Why do people reject the good news of Jesus Christ if it is indeed such good news? Now, one of the ways that Mark sometimes structures his account to make a point is what we've already observed in the last couple of weeks is um, a kind of sandwich. So the two outer passages that we have here are informed by the middle passage. And so the heart of this passage, in other words, why this rejection of Jesus is going on is there in verse 12. Just look down. They went out and preached that people should repent. The call to repentance has never been particularly popular. It wasn't particularly popular in Jesus' day. It's not particularly popular today. It's a call to turn around, to change your orientation, the fundamental dispositions of your life, from living without reference to God, in an outright rejection to God, consciously or not, to living for God through Jesus Christ. That's the call. And it wasn't popular then. It led to the beheading of John the Baptist, led to the rejection of Jesus, even in his hometown. And it's not popular today. We're a culture today where one of the great virtues is acceptance. You are beautiful no matter what they say. The great philosopher of our generation, Christina Aguilera, once said, you are beautiful in every single way. And if that's true, then any call to repentance goes against that because it says, no, you're, you're loved. And there are beautiful things about you made in the image of God, but there's so much wrong with each and every one of us. And you've got to change. So you're not unconditionally beautiful in every single way. Things need to change. That is not popular. Oprah Winfrey has said that what she's trying to change in the one hour of her program, I don't watch it by the way, I just picked this up online, is the root problem of all the world, lack of self-esteem. Social commentator in the US, Laura Miller, who has thought quite a lot about this, writes how in previous societies, the hero narrative was all about overcoming external problems. The war hero who overcomes a situation of great odds to save his um, brothers and others. The scientist who perseveres to find a cure for the disease as she labours night and day. Their external problems out there and something great has to change to bring that heroic act about. But today the hero narrative, Laura Miller says, is one of inside yourself. You are the hero in your own story and the great barriers you face are the barriers inside your own life. And therefore, learning to accept yourself and self-esteem is you being the hero. But of course the problem with that is if you are already the hero in your life, then where's the call to change? Heroic people used to be a standard out there that we could aspire to be. The person who climbed the mountain, we could be like that person. The person who discovered the cure, we could be like her. And we aspire to change and to be better, but if you are already a hero, there's no call to change. And so the call to repent and believe the Gospel, Mark 1.15, is suddenly stripped of a lot of its power. Oh, we love faith, believe in Jesus who loves you unconditionally, but we're not so sure about the call to change, to turn your life around. Well, let's look at this passage and see this call to repentance. And what we're going to see as we go through it is the challenge of the call to repent. Then as we go on, we're going to see the mission of calling people to repent. 
And then finally, in the John the Baptist episode, we're going to see the reason that people don't like the call to repent. Let's look first of all at the first passage, verses 1 to 6, and the challenge of the call to repent. Now, even though repentance isn't mentioned directly in verses 1 to 6, Mark is writing it with us expecting it and imagining that it's there. And that's, as I said, why it comes up in verse 12. Because every time Jesus goes anywhere in Mark's gospel, he calls people to repent and believe. So it's a deliberate literary device that he doesn't mention it here because he wants us to be thinking about it. And the scene starts in a familiar way. Jesus is going to a new town, but this time we see verse 1. It's his hometown. He teaches and performs miracles, as he often does, and initially he seems to get a very familiar response. Look down at verse 2. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. But then verse 3, something changes. Where did this man get these things, he asked? What's this wisdom that has been given to him? What are these remarkable miracles he's performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Is this Mary's son? And the brother of James and Joseph, Judas and Simon? Do you see how quickly it turns from astonishment and amazement and almost reverence to disdain? To trying to bring him down a peg or two. He's just a local man. His, his, his sisters are over there. He's the carpenter's son. There's nothing special about him. Now what's going on here? Well, I think one of the ways that Mark writes this is causing us to compare and contrast with some of the previous scenes we've seen in Mark's Gospel. So keep a finger in Mark chapter 6 and just flick back to Mark chapter 1 and look at verse 21 with me. So Mark has a very typical kind of rhythm in his Gospel of Jesus going to a place, teaching, performing miracles. We see it quite often. The typical one is set on Mark 1, 21. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, notice the Sabbath again, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach identical to chapter 6. The people were amazed at his teaching, verse 22, because he taught them as one who had authority, not as teachers of the law. Now, that sentence is not there in chapter 6. In other words, the people in Mark chapter 1 recognized Jesus' authority, so what's going in verse 3 of chapter 6? What's going on? The people are resisting his authority. They're trying to bring him down a peg. They're trying to say, because we know him and know his family, he has no authority. There's nothing special about this man. He's just a man like any other. And they take offence at him, we're told. And verse 5, he couldn't do any miracles there. Now, the commentators often tie themselves a knot at this point, so rather than, I think, taking a really obvious explanation, the reason he can't do miracles there is not because he lacks some power if people don't respond with faith. That would be to diminish Jesus of his power. Jesus can do miracles whenever he wants. The point is, he can't do miracles because people aren't bringing anybody to him. They're holding them back. There's only a few people who come. Even though Jesus is there with all authority, and authority to heal, and authority to do the miraculous, Yet because they take offence and they won't even bring people to him, such as their resistance to his authority. And why do people reject Jesus and his call to repent? Because he is the Son of God with all authority on heaven and earth. And if you see that and if you recognise that, then suddenly the call to repent has real weightiness behind it. But if you resist that, then of course you want him out of your life. I remember a number of years ago speaking at a, um, a mission um, week and speaking through the week. And on the last day, a young woman who had been listening to the talk throughout the week came up to me. And you could see she really been <coughs> thinking it through and chatting it through with her friends and trying to work it out. And we sat down and had a coffee. And at one point in the conversation, she said to me, If I understand what you've been saying rightly, then Jesus has all authority. He created everything, He's sustaining everything. He's the Lord of all. I said, Yeah, that's right. And she said, and he's died for everybody. That means there's nothing he can't ask of anyone. I said, yeah, you're right. She said, I find that scary. I think she was very shrewd. If Jesus has all authority in heaven and earth, and if he has died for every single person who lives, then is there anything that he can't ask? Or to put it another way, if he has all power and is infinitely good, then he, is, he knows what's in your best interest. Anything he calls you to is in your best interest. But that means the safest place to be, the best place to be, is complete surrender, where you give everything to him. And as human beings, we find that very uncomfortable. We love our autonomy. We love to say that we're in charge. We love to fool ourselves into thinking that we are the best guardians of our own best interests when all evidence to the contrary is pretty plain before us. 
and so we resist. And we try to downsize Jesus. There are familiar ways to do that, aren't there? We say he's a good teacher, wonderful teaching. <laughs> he never claimed he was God. No, no, no. No, that was our third or fourth century construction, despite the obvious evidence that it wasn't. Oh, he's come to give us an example to follow. What a wonderful example it is. He hasn't called us to repent, despite the fact that he calls us to repent all the time. He's a saviour. Well, he's not a lord. No, no, have him as your saviour. But you can have him as your saviour, not have him as your lord. My friends, these tricks to downplay the authority of Jesus are as old as the scriptures themselves. And yet if Jesus really is who he says he is, he calls each one of us to put our lives in his hands, the safest and best place. He says, turn around. Believe in me, yes, and as you believe in me, trust me, obey me. Do what I say, I know what's in your best interests. How hard we find that. Which leads us secondly to the mission of calling people to repent. Verse 6, Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith. So what happened? Well, it goes on. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. As Jesus is rejected in one place, so he moves on and opportunities open up in the next place. And verse 7, he calls the twelve to him. He began to send them out two by two and gave them, notice what? Gave them authority over impure spirits. And you see, therefore, at verse 12, that as he sends them out to preach that people should repent... That is, that people need to turn from living for themselves and instead live for him, the true king. The same message that he's been preaching, he now gives to his disciples to preach. And so the link here is that as the apostles are sent out, they are sent out not with their own authority, but with Jesus' authority. And because they carry his authority, they go with the authoritative message to call people to repent and believe the good news. And it's really striking how Jesus sends them out. Look with me at the curious details in verse 8 and following. I wonder what you meant of them. The first thing is, he sends them out urgently. Verse 8, these were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. These verses echo the Exodus account where the people of God are called after the Passover to leave Egypt in haste. Listen to Exodus 12 verse 11. This is how you are to eat your meal, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, to eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Do you see the resonance here with Mark? He's saying that because there's this authoritative call, go urgently. You must go, but go urgently. People need to hear this message. He then sends them also out in weakness. Look at what we're told. No bag, so you have no provisions. No food and money, so you are totally reliant on God to provide. Not even an extra shirt in case it gets cold, which it definitely could do in the Middle East. They're sent out in weakness. Why does he send them out in weakness? With none of the trappings of security that we normally look for. Because he wants them to rely not on their own strength, not on their own authority, but on his authority, on the power of the one in whose name they go. And lastly, they are sent out realistically. Jesus says, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town, and if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet. In other words, he says, don't expect that it's going to be everyone thinking you're the best news. You will be rejected. Here's the tactic for how you handle that rejection. You're gracious, you're loving, you stay with people all the while they give you a hearing, but if they don't want to listen to it anymore, you don't force it on them. If they reject the message, they're not going to be rejecting you, they're rejecting me, and so you move on to someone who will accept it. Now it's striking to me that whilst these conditions are fulfilled today in a very different way, urgency, weakness and realism in mission are so important today, and often lacking. Urgency, we are 2,000 years further on, has the urgency got less? No, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ when he returns in judgment is sooner now. The urgency is greater, and so much of the New Testament says to you, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, go with this message, go urgently, because the next thing in God's diary is his return. And when he returns, there will be no opportunities for last and reprieves then. Now is the day of salvation. Today, so go, go urgently. 
If it was urgent then, it's more urgent today. So often, we miss this call. We get caught up with other things in life. I'll do it next week. There I say, the Christmas cards are a wonderful opportunity. They still have a kind of cultural acceptance, and we will do everything we can as volunteers and staff here at Inspire St. James Clarkmore to preach the message faithfully and to put on a great event so that people can hear the good news and hear the call to repent and believe. Will you invite? Will you invite urgently? Or will you say, well, I'm hopeless at mission? Great, you're in good company. Because Jesus loves people who are weak. He sends people out who are weak. We often think as Christians that our weakness is a barrier to him using us, when it's the very precondition of him using us. Because if he sends out the strong and those who feel gifted and those who feel able, all the glory goes to them. And you know what? If you've ever, if you're a person who goes against, if you've ever been witnessed to by someone who feels self-sufficient for mission, it is an obnoxious experience, isn't it? You know what really convinced me when I was at university? People who are a year below me and so haven't read as much as me, I think I probably won every argument, I was pretty obnoxious. But they just kept going at it, and there was a humility and a weakness about them, and I just couldn't deny it, and I was so attracted to it, such that even though they lost the arguments, they won me. My friends, you know that. You say, I'm a hopeless witness. Great. God loves people like you, because in your weakness, he magnifies his strength. It's not about our ability. It's about our availability. Here I am, Lord. Use me. I can barely speak the gospel properly, you say. Great, he'll use you. Use whatever you've got. Go in weakness. He loves to use weak people because it magnifies his strength, and that's the point. Go urgently, go weakly, and as you go, be realistic. If you go and the first person you share the gospel with rejects you, probably in this culture, just with a cold shoulder, and you find it too unpleasant, you say, well, I, I, I thought if I just said it the right way, or if I prayed enough, or if I tried to be winsome enough, they would accept me, then you'll just give up at the first hurdle. My friends, it has never been that everybody accepts the gospel. Be realistic. You know the places in the world today where the gospel is growing quickest? Top two countries, according to Operation Mission, where evangelical faith is growing at 90%, are Iran and Afghanistan. You can lose your life in both of those countries for sharing the gospel. Do you think that as Christians go there, they feel strong? No, they feel terribly weak. Do you think everyone accepts it? Not at all. And yet the Lord is at work. It's the same in our culture. Go urgently. Go in weakness. And go with realism. As the words of the hymn say, we go in faith our own great weakness feeling and needing more each day thy strength to know, but from our hearts a song of triumph pealing. We rest on thee, we rely on thee, Lord, and in your name, your strength, we go. Well, let's look lastly then at the reason why people don't repent. Verses 14 and following in this rather, well, it's compelling, isn't it? But it's pretty gritty. The account of John the Baptist is just as well the children are out of the room. For the Greeks and the Romans, the great struggle for human beings was between intellect and emotions. Emotions were often placed in the body, the bodily parts of human beings, and so it was really a battle of mind over matter. And you became the right person by reason, dominating and overcoming your capricious, your varying emotions. That was the great battle. Today, we have inherited those gifts from the Greeks, and we've not been very wary of Greek spirit gifts. And so now we say the great battle is still between the intellect and the emotion, but it's switched. The emotion must rule the intellect. Find your deepest feelings. Realize your deepest feelings. They reveal to you who you truly are. That's the narrative of our culture. Emotions rule. If you really feel you are something, you are that thing. And everything else, your intellect, your body, culture around you, all need to align with that. Well, in Scripture, the battle is not between intellect and emotion. The battle is within one faculty and is located there. It's the heart, the place of our desires. The battle for following God in the Christian life is always located in the heart. We're actually going to see this in chapter 7 when we get there. Out of the problems, of all, all the problems of our lives come from our hearts and all the great solutions in our life come as God works in our hearts. 
And so as we look at this, we're intended to be asking, if Herod is there with the person that Jesus says is the greatest prophet the world has ever known, in other words, the greatest missioner, the greatest evangelist, often known as John the Evangelist, John the Baptizer, because he baptized so many people. If he is in front of Herod and Herod rejects, why does Herod reject? It's not because of lack of information. And it's not because their emotions are the ruling, though no doubt they are. It's the desires of his heart. And everything about this account is structured to show that to us. So that as we go out with the gospel message, we are realistic. That the reason people reject the call to repent, and the reason we so often struggle with it, is because of our desires in our hearts. Let's um, pick it up at verse 17. Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother, Philip's wife, just get your head around that one, whom he had married. So his brother's still alive, he's divorced his existing wife, and he's next his brother's wife. John has been saying something pretty uncontroversial. Verse 18, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. If you struggle with that afterwards, just grab me and I'll pass really help you understand that. There's nothing controversial about that at all. It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. But Herodias, verse 19, nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him, but she was not able to, because Herod feared John and protected him. So Herod is a complicated man. This is not Herod the Great. This is his son, Herod Antipas. And actually, history recalls all these details as well. And by the way, this is his undoing historically as well. This causes a rift with him politically, which ultimately leads to him being um, chucked out of power and killed. So here we have Herod Antipas. But he loves to listen to John the Baptist. But he also wants to do what his new wife, illegally married, does. And so he puts John in prison and then occasionally brings him out to listen to him. And every time he comes out, John the Baptist will explain the gospel to him and call him to repentance. Stop doing what you're doing, Herod. John will speak truth to power. Now look how beautifully and brilliantly the narrative is set up. Verse 21. Finally, the opportune time came. Question, opportunity for what? What's the opportunity here? Deliberately ambiguous. Mark is saying there's an opportunity in a number of different ways. There's an opportunity here for Herod to accept the message of Christ, to repent and believe the gospel. This is the moment when he could have made that public declaration and how he should have done that. Or there's also an insidious opportunity here for Herodias to get her way and to kill John the Baptist. And for Herod to go down as a footnote in history for a great act of evil, of a weak man. The opportune time. My friends, it's just worth saying, at various points in life, you can reflect on an opportune time. You know it. You feel it in that moment. You think, I've got to make a stand for the Lord here. Maybe I've got to make a decision where I stand for the Lord here. That opportunity is there. Now, the Lord is gracious. There are always second and third chances. But when the opportunity is there, can I ask, are you ready to take it? Herod should have done. It was his greatest error in his life. He didn't. Let's see why he didn't. Verse 22. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, it's all very seedy, isn't it? This is now the daughter of his wife, dancing. She pleased Herod and his dinner guests. And now we see the ego and the weakness of the man. The king said to the girl, ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, whatever you ask, I'll give you up to half my kingdom. So he's boasting, he's trying to play to the crowd, he's got a full court, he's trying to play the big man, no doubt, living under the shadow of his father. And she went out, verse 24, and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. What is Herod going to do? He could say that's outrageous. He could say that's disgusting. He said, of course I'm not going to do that. That would be unjust. He could call her out on it. He could show some strength for once in his life. And he could take the opportunity to repent. But no. Lust had gripped his heart. The fear of people in his courtroom has long since held sway over him. And so because of the desires of his heart, he gives in. Notice how Mark makes it really clear what Herod knows about John the Baptist. Verse 20, he feared and protected him, knowing him to be righteous and holy. Verse 20, again, he likes to listen to him. In other words, he's a war within himself. What's going to win out? The desire to do the right thing, to follow God, to repent and believe. 
or lust and people pleasing. And so, verse 26, the king was greatly distressed, but because of his oaths and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent out an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went to behead of John in the prison and brought back his head in a dish. What does this tell us? First, it helps us to understand ourselves. Dare I say, if you think that you are a rational person, ruled by your intellect, and if you're just given sufficient information about Jesus Christ, you will always choose him. Please hear me try and say to the Lord Grace, you really don't understand yourself very well at all. The heart, our desires, rules the head. Archbishop Cranmer, the great founder of the Church of England in its reformed form, said, what the heart wants, the will chooses, and the intellect justifies. In other words, we make the choice with our hearts, our wills follow suit, and then we're very clever about giving all kinds of coherent justifications afterwards, but the heart rules. And Jesus comes to call our hearts to turn to him, to repent and believe. As Christians, so often, we say, well, I know these things, why am I finding it so hard to do that? It's because of your heart. As Christians, so often, we know the right thing to do, but we don't want to do it, and that's the problem. We need to pray to the Lord, Lord, change my heart, give me an undivided heart. And we're so good at coming up with intellectual justifications, I'm not sure the Bible really says it. Our different people disagree over this text. It's been hotly contested, as if any verse in the Scriptures has not been hotly contested. Culture says a different thing. We're Western people now. We think those arguments are new. They've been around for 2,000 years, and they'll be around in 2,000 years. And they're just clever justifications to worm our ways out of the call to repent. It's obvious. The Lord says it. He calls us to do it. He knows what's best for us. Lay our hearts bare before and say, Lord, I don't want to do this. Help me to do it. We need to understand ourselves. Secondly, it helps us to understand others. I so often get into this mistake. I think if I go and give a talk and if I can just be compelling enough, if I can show the reasons of Scripture enough, people will accept Christ. And I often leave disappointed. Here's the point. If the Spirit is not at work, changing people's hearts, giving them a heart of flesh where it's a heart of stone, moving them to follow God's decrees, it's all pointless. Jesus was the best preacher who ever walked the earth. At the end of his life, virtually nobody followed him because the Spirit had not yet come. Without the Spirit, we have no hope. But the Spirit is the one who brings new life and gives a new heart. And so trusting God to change people's hearts by the Spirit. And thirdly, it helps us to understand God's sovereignty. Did you notice earlier on in the passage that as Jesus was rejected in verse 6, that the opportunity opened up in verse 7 for him to go around teaching from village to village? In other words, even as people reject Jesus, God is sovereignly working to take forward his gospel so that people accept it. The greatest example of this is, of course, as the Son of God is rejected on the cross, the wonderful, marvelous sovereignty of God is such that he is opening up his arms wide so that everybody can come in. So that as people reject Jesus on the cross and put the final nail into his arms, God is finishing his plan so that all people can come to him. Nothing can stop God's great plan of salvation. And when people resist it because they don't want to repent, still God marches on and draws many to himself. One door closes, God in his sovereign grace opens up another door. Jesus himself said, when the Son of Man is lifted up, he will draw all people to himself. Do you see what's going on there? As he's rejected, he is actually paving the way for acceptance. It's the same today. I remember vividly when I became a Christian in my rugby club, there were three of us actually in the senior squad who witnessed to pretty much all of the senior squad. Not one of those men who had seen my life turn around and nothing who came to many talks ever accepted Christ. I still pray for them now. We'll see them in a few weeks and I'll keep them praying for them. But as the senior squad rejected, so a number of us went and started talking to the under 21s in the junior squad. And from that, a number of people accepted the gospel. And one of those is in pastoral ministry today. The Lord always works that way. Someone rejects, he says you keep loving them, you keep praying for them, but you move on, you talk to someone else. And as one door closes, the Lord's sovereignty and mission is such that another door opens. My friends, 
be encouraged, keep going out with a message to call people to repent, be realistic as you go, and if you feel weak, trust the work of the Spirit, the Lord's in control, he will bring fruit this time, but we must all be repent. let me listen to prayer. They went out and preached that people should repent, Heavenly Father, how we need to hear that message today, we feel the pressure of the culture not to call people to that, we want to accentuate Jesus' love, and it's right because he is the most infinitely loving man who's ever lived. By dying on the cross, he has paved the way for us to come to you. But equally, there is always a cost. There is always a call to repent, to obey, to trust him as our Lord, not just our Saviour. Help us to be sent out, Lord, with that message. And if we've not yet received that message, Lord, would we repent and believe the gospel we pray? We ask it for Jesus' sake.